This episode of The Minimalist is brought to you by nobody, because advertisements suck. The Minimalists. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are The Minimalists. In our culture, more seems to be the answer to everything, Ryan. Mm. More stuff, more money, more status, more friends, more food, more sex, more imbibing, more pleasure, more, more, more. Mm. The cult of more has become so common that we rarely stop to consider how much is enough. Yeah. Let's change that today, Ryan. Okay. Let's today talk we're, about it. Well, we're going to talk about enoughism, mm. and we're going to identify how much is enough Ryan has a secret number of things we'll share on the private podcast. That's this week. right. Stay tuned <laughs> for the perfect amount of things. When they were saying the meaning of life is 42, they meant 42 items. Right, exactly. And then you'll find meaning. <laughs> All the great mystics already knew this. Wouldn't it be great if it was that easy? Yes. Um, and, you know, I don't know if we need to wait till later in the podcast to talk about this, but when it comes to enough, we were talking before we started recording. I was trying to exclaim, explain to you how I look at enough like I look at perfection. Okay. It's like there is only something can be only so perfect. There's See, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you 100% so far. I also look at enough like I look at perfection. Yes. Yeah. So, then that's actually, that's all it is. Okay. Yeah. Although. Where, where, where did you not agree? Well, I think that what I agree, what I disagree about, maybe not even disagree, is my understanding of enough is it is birthed out of subtraction almost always and so when yeah. we're talking about enoughism today and we're talking about how do I identify enough it's not about how do I get more to get enough and that's the problem with our culture right it's about how do I subtract to uncover enough yeah I guess oh it's interesting because I take it from the perspective of let's say there's someone who uh is like has nothing mm -hmm. a homeless person okay so they start from nothing so then they well, start to bring things into their lot, like they need a home, mm -hmm. right? Maybe they need a kitchen table. So that's where I'm taking it from. So in, in that aspect of bringing in more, if you have nothing, but you're right, most of us anyone listening already to this have enough or too much. Has enough or more than enough. Yeah, totally. And almost certainly that. more than enough. Now, yeah. because of nuance, Ryan, I think that enoughism might be a, a even better description for minimalism in some respects. Yeah. I do want to differentiate the two real quickly, mm -hmm. though. Mm -hmm. I think enoughism is actually one step sort of more ascetic than, than minimalism in a way. Because mm -hmm. minimalism also embraces the non-essential items. Yeah. Y you and I as minimalists, it's not that we deprive ourselves. What we do is we identify what is essential, i.e. what is enough, mm -hmm. and then also we identify what is non-essential and what's junk. As mm -hmm. minimalists, we, we remove all the junk from our lives. Yes. This is called the no junk rule in our minimalist rule book, 16 rules for living with less. You can download that for free over on our website. But with this new ju no junk rule, what we say is everything you own can fit in one of three piles. It's either essential, non-essential, or junk. Once yeah. we identify the junk, we get rid of that. I think there's two types of enough in this scenario. Yeah. When we think of enough, we often think of like the essential items, yeah. housing, clothing, food, or, you know, uh, um, education, transportation, vocation. Mm -hmm. That's what we think of as essential. But then there's like all of the non-essential. Many of those are actual things in our life. Yeah. And if we're being 100% candid, I have this glass here. I'll hold it up for the camera. It's this glass of water. Yeah. The water is enough. Right. The glass is value adding. Mm. But I could drink this water out without, of the tap. Out of, yeah, out of the tap. <laughs> well, I wouldn't drink tap water. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's fluoride and other things I don't want in my body. Out of the water filter. Yes. Person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, I could drink water out of you know my hands or you sure. know well, whatever it might be. And, and so you're right. I could drink water out of the tap. It'd be yeah. fine. But um, when I – actually, it might not be fine. There's also uranium in a lot of water supplies now. So we're <laughs> all living in some variation of Flint. It's unbelievable. Mm. Um, any, anyhow, when we get back to this, well, the water is essential – the glass is non-essential, but it's value adding. Yes. And so that's a different kind of enough. One is enough as in I need something. I need enough. But then there's the other sort of I desire 
enough. The th- I desire the things that enhance or augment, amplify my experience of life. My couch, my kitchen table, my bed. For many thousands of years, humans live without beds. Yeah. And therefore, it can't be essential. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, and yet, in society, a bed is pretty much essential. Even, mm. even we see homeless people who have beds. So when we talk essential, uh-huh. you're meaning like, sur- like b- b- able to survive. Like s- to, to live a, to live a uh, healthy quality of life or a basic standard of, of life? No, I think that's what I'm talking about non-essentials to a great extent. Now, often people will say non-essentials and they lump junk into that. And so mm-hmm. I want to be really clear. I'm not talking about junk. We spend $1.2 trillion a year on, quote, non-essentials, but yeah. it's really almost all junk. Sure. You know, we're spending more on watches and, and jewelry than we are on higher TVs. education. Yeah, yeah, and, and so there there is there is a uh, a way to look at our things. Whereas if you take away all the things, you look mm-hmm. at humanity. Mm-hmm. Huma- humans have thrived for tens of thousands of years, mm-hmm. even without all of the modern accoutrements. Right, hundred percent. So you're saying that those people tens of thousands of years ago, they had enough. That would be enough. They certainly had enough. Okay. And, and they also didn't live in society. And so living right. in society, you know, post-civilized world, mm-hmm. we actually require some more non-essentials to get us to enough as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so I'm saying that modern life does require more than pre-civilized life. And I'm not suggesting that you and I go back to live in the woods with loincloths. Yeah. Uh, I'd be, be down. Well, well, as an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Even that might be non-essential, the loincloth itself. <laughs> right. We're yeah. going commando. That's right. Before we get into our questions, Ryan, I wanted to bring this up to you. You know, we have yeah. minimalist.org. It's yes. our 100 free local meetup groups, 100 different cities in eight countries. We also have an online city if none of the cities are near you or if you just want to participate with uh, over 14,000 people in this group. And uh, Kathleen shared this. I'll hold it up for YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube. She has a, a version of enough that, that's different for, for uh, her than it is for me. And I think it's one of the things I want to get across here. When we're identifying what is enough in terms of non-essentials, your enough is going to look different from my enough. Right. Yeah. So it's and, not a universal enough. Yeah, and what's interesting about enough, uh-huh. it's always changing. Yes. It's not this, it's not this, uh, this episode isn't going to make someone realize like, oh, here's what enough is. Mm-hmm. And then they're go- going to either go get enough or they're going to get rid of until they have enough. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to be like, oh, okay, I'm all finished. Right. Never have to do that again. And if you're listening to this, right, you can't go get enough. Right. Enough is not purchasable. Right. Mm-hmm. Enough is not a product. Enough is not a, a consumer good, right? Mm. Now, you're right. If we're living in a state of deprivation, if we're starving to death, then right. of course we don't have enough. Yeah, I was thinking about like um, toilet paper, for example, right? Uh-huh. So let's say someone right now listening to this is out of toilet paper. They got to go get TP, right? Yes. They don't want to buy it one square at a time. And they also don't want to buy a pallet of toilet paper. Right. Like there is a, there is a uh, well, I should say there isn't a number that says enough, but mm-hmm. you can get enough toilet paper uh, without having a specific number. There's an essence there. Right. Where if I go buy, like I know if I go buy a pack of toilet paper that has four in it, Mm -hmm. that's probably not enough for me and my family for a prolonged period of time. And I don't want to go to the the corner store every other day to buy Mm -hmm. toilet paper. And so I'm going to buy enough for a specific period of time. Yeah. Now, it's true that we could go through a pallet of toilet paper. Sure. Especially Ella. Oh, my gosh. I don't know what she's doing in that, that bathroom. Butt wiper. She's just wrapping around her hand. She's coming <laughs> out wrapped like a mummy. <laughs> anyway, what, I, what I've recognized is enough is also it has it to do with a, a particular time frame. So that pallet of toilet paper is enough toilet paper for two years maybe. Sure. I just don't want to purchase it all at once. Yeah, you don't want to purchase it one square at a time. You don't want to purchase two years worth. Right. right. So enough for what period? That's a great question, mm-hmm. Ryan. Now, I want to hold up Kathleen's uh, picture here. She says, I want my house to look like this. And it's like this studio apartment. Maybe you could describe it a bit. I'll hold it up for I the YouTube it. camera. Well, on just on one side of the room. So it's a big room, and then it's divided into a bath, a bedroom. A and very then, tiny bedroom. Yeah, very tiny bedroom, very tiny bathroom, kitchen, dining, lounge. <laughs> That's about, uh, I would say... 10%? Yeah, 20% maybe. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, and then the rest of it is just open floor plan 
and on the open floor plan it says plants. And that's it. Yeah, I actually know of someone who has done something similar to this. Like, think about the McMansions that there there are in Ohio. Yes, I know and someone Texas who, and Florida and yeah. Th- there's so uh, I was visiting a friend over. Uh, a couple weekends ago in Las Vegas, and they have friends who has this McMansion uh-huh. that they literally turned into like an animal sanctuary. Mm. So it's like, a, it's a, uh, the way they were describing it to me, it's, it, the inside feels very outside. Like they have a, a big pond in their living room. Yes. They like rescue all these animals. Uh-huh. It's very, uh, it's like a, you know, kind of barnish, uh-huh. farmish, I guess. Right. But anyway, um, yeah, it's interesting because they have all that space, but like they, did something very similar to what Kathleen Kathleen is doing with uh yeah having very little living space and mostly just space for uh, plants and animals. So enough has a lot to do with our individual priorities, right? Because 100%. if I were to go live in Kathleen's space, like mm-hmm. I have a few plants in my home. You can check out the home tour over mm-hmm. at theminimalists.com slash resources, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's on our resource page. Ryan and I both did home tours over there. Anyway, I have some plants, but if we filled my entire home with plants, it would drive me insane. Yeah. In fact, mm-hmm. it's not even my, my duty to water the plants. Uh, that is Bex's duty because <laughs> it is her desire to have the plants in the home in the first place. What are you doing? She's not there. You just like let them spit on them. <laughs> Minerals, right? <laughs> Any, anyway, Kathleen has enough for her. Her idea of enough for her mm-hmm. is too much for me. Right. And so keep that in mind as well. And all, by the way, I might have too much of something for her that is like more than enough and more than enough is what most of us have in most aspects of our life yes and that's what we're gonna be talking about today we got a question from twitter uh barbara has a question for us right why does anyone want more getting to the heart of individual whys can be the key to transformation also the converse why does anyone want to get rid of their stuff the reasons are personal and figuring those out can help one realize when they are enough i think the the answer to the first question right why does anyone want more and the one word answer to that is i, I think it's fear mm. and actually i don't think that it, it, the truth is that it's fear now what type of fear is the question because fear underlies any sort of quote-unquote negative emotion whether that is you know uh, uh grief, sadness, whatever, there's attachment, you know, there's a type of fear that is, we call desire, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now, there are various types of desire, the more pernicious kind we might call craving. Mm-hmm. And so if someone want, wants more, maybe the better question here is, why do we always crave yeah. more? I think it has to do with, like, pleasure, which I think maybe we're saying the same thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's like you you're scared of not feeling pleasure or yes. feeling happiness. So you run towards getting more because the idea of that makes you think that it's going to be, it's going to bring pleasure. Mm. A- Anthony DeMello says that we aren't afraid of the unknown. We often hear about, hear about the fear of the unknown. Mm. He said, we're afraid of losing the known. Yeah. And the known you're talking about here is that dopamine rush, that yeah. pleasure. And, and so in a weird way, we're actually setting ourselves up for displeasure by searching for pleasure through all of these ephemeral pursuits. Yeah. We all know that it's not lasting, but if I get this and I get that, I do feel the pleasure, but the converse of that is all of the peak is always the valley. You can't have one without the other, but of course, and there's nothing wrong with pleasure, but if we're always seeking pleasure, we won't have peace. Yeah. And so I think in a weird way, we the, to answer the second part of the question here, uh, she says, the, why does anyone want to get rid of their stuff? is because they recognize that they've lost peace in their life. When you lose peace, Mm. you lose a particular kind of freedom. Mm. And so they're searching for freedom. So the fear and the pleasure that drives the consumption ultimately, for many of us, leads to this realization that, oh, what I really crave isn't pleasure. It's Mm. peace. It's freedom. Yeah. I mean, there's got to be something primal there too, right? You know, going back to like hunters, gatherers, Mm -hmm. they had to store up a bunch of food. Um, Think about they didn't know hunters and hunter gatherers didn't store up food. Hmm. Um, Well, I guess I'm thinking like pre-industrial, so like 1800s. Yeah, agricultural societies did. Okay, sure. Yeah. So, um, 
and the reason why they did that though is because having to forage every time you needed something to eat uh was wasn't, harder. Yeah, it was harder. It wasn't as appealing as having like some you know, what do they call it? Uh cured ham that's been sitting in salt, <laughs> right. you know, for all summer and you can just go and get it. So, I mean, there is something there with and it goes back to fear, like the fear of not having enough, the fear of not having sustenance. Mm -hmm. So since we have evolved to kind of have this hoarding mentality, mm -hmm. um, it's it's just amplified by post-industrial, the post-industrial age, whether it's marketing. Convenience. Convenience, access to goods, um, whether it's uh, uh, like cheaply or easily made products, mm -hmm. you know, so... So yeah, mass let, production. So yeah. So it's like that. That those things feed into what is kind of naturally what we've naturally evolved to, and it just, it just really yeah, uh, uh, exponentially like increases our desire to hoard. Right, and and now that desire is peaked by other people's interests. Right, mm -hmm. and marketers and advertisers they work really hard to increase your craving. Right. And so as before, where you had a natural craving, oh, I'm hungry. That's a natural desire to fulfill a basic human need. Yeah. To stay warm is a, a natural desire to, to stay alive. We're talking about things to stay alive yeah. and to ultimately reproduce. The, mm. the, that's how, what we've evolved to do over 300,000 or 3 million years um, as, as hominids. Um, Anyway, when I look at other sort of primate ancestors, mm -hmm. and we write about this in Love People Use Things. Oh, hold that up for the camera as well. We got a new book coming out in July, July 13th. You can pre order it right now. It helps us out a ton. It's called Love People Use Things, Love People Use Things dot net. It's where you can find it. And Ryan and I are even going to read it to you. Yeah. Dude. Personally, we're going to show up in your living room. That's right. <laughs> it's going to be really annoying. It's going to be like 2 a.m. It's only if you buy the VIP package and there's only one available. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in, in the book, what we talk about is they did the, the study uh, that I quote in the book uh, of these primates, bonobos mm -hmm. and chimpanzees, our two closest ancestors, yeah. right, mm -hmm. uh, that are still living. Uh, and, and so when you look at it, they both behave the same when they're babies or young kids, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the, when young bonobos, young chimps see a horde of bananas, yeah. their first inclination is to share it with other people yeah. or other chimps and bonobos. Right. Um, hey, bonobos are people too, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but as as they both get older, they bifurcate. And the the older chimps will fight to the death to keep their horde to keep their horde of bananas they'll fight off other the chimpanzees isn't or bonobos it, or people is, isn't isn't there a piece of that study too where it showed if a chimp had only one banana or two bananas they would share it but, so if they had but, one they would eat it if they yeah. had enough to share mm -hmm. um they would share if they had enough to eat and share they would share it with their group mm -hmm. if there was a horde of bananas they'd fight for it th they would yeah fight like to the death wow. to maintain a horde which they could by the way never eat all of those before they go so, bad so this is exactly what i'm trying to say like it's ingrained in us uh -huh. to have a horde man i mean i don't it's a natural tendency where does it come from i don't know sort of is okay and here's here's what i'm saying i think we get to choose we because oh of course we either yeah. get to be as adults am i a, a bonobo or am I a chimpanzee? Because so the bonobos continue to share well into their adulthood. Mm. And it's been replicated over and over and over in experiments. Okay. And it's like, oh, wow. Bonobos, that seems like what... That seems much more ideal than the, the violence, the fear, yeah. that causes the violence and that causes hoarding. Hoarding is caused by fear, mm. which is a particular kind of evil when you really think about it. Yeah. You know, before we get into some of our callers here, Ryan, let me read this excerpt from Love People Use Things. This is called, You Don't Need That. Ryan and I moved to Los Angeles in 2017 to establish a film and podcast studio for The Minimalists. As soon as we arrived in the city, I noticed I was drawn to what everyone else had already had. Granite countertops, Teslas, limited edition Air Jordan sneakers. Perhaps the American neo-conceptual artist Ginny Holzer was on to something when she painted, quote, The unattainable is invariably attractive on the side 
of a BMW art car at the Porsche Museum in Germany. Think about that for a second, right? The unattainable is attractive. Mm. When something is unattainable, we seem to want it more. Yeah. And then as soon as we're able to attain the thing, we lose our desire for it. God, there's something there too with wanting what we can't have. Exactly. Yeah. Even as a minimalist, I found the overwhelming pool of consumerism made it difficult not to think I needed everything I saw. Luckily, I'd unknowingly been preparing for the land of Lamborghinis, Melrose Place, and triple-decker triple strip malls for nearly a decade. If there is a core message within minimalism, it's this. You probably don't need that. Think about that for a second. Minimalism basically means you probably don't need that. Right. If you sum it up in <laughs> a, a pithy little line, yeah. minimalism, you probably don't need that. Yeah. We trick ourselves into believing that we do need that couch, that cookware, that eyeliner, that skirt, that statuette. Perhaps that's because we've evolved to dupe ourselves. The prime directive of the mind is to deceive itself, claims the analytic philosopher Bernardo Castrup, author of More Than Allegory. Quote, our reality is created by an extraordinary subtle process of self-deception. So we're constantly deceiving ourselves. Yeah. And I think that goes into the answering Barbara's question here about more. Why do we always want more? Mm. Is because we're always deceiving ourselves. Yeah. And the uh, unattainable is attractive. And so we're attracted by these things, so we deceive ourselves to think we need those things. Mm. Return to the text here. Mm -hmm. When you extend Castrop's claim to the material world, it instantly seems obvious. If the average household contains hundreds of thousands of items, most of which get in the way and don't increase our happiness, then why do we hold on to all that junk? The answer is simple. Because of the stories we tell ourselves. Mm. That's why we hold on to junk. And by the way, that's why we pursue more, more, more. Mm. We tell ourselves these narratives yeah. that we're not complete, that we need more. Yeah. What disempowering stories do you tell mm. yourself about your stuff? What new empowering stories could you create to change that narrative? I often hear members of the media say that the Ameri American dream is more out of reach than ever. But that's not true. It's easier than ever to reach the American dream. The problem is we're reaching for the wrong things. Yeah. Once upon a time, the American dream was modest. If you worked hard at your modest job, you could afford a, to build a modest house on a modest piece of land and live a modest life. You would have enough. Mm. Today, however, we want it all and we want it now. A bigger house and a bigger car and a bigger life. Mm. shopping sprees and lavish dinners and Instagram worthy moments because we're addicted to the dopamine rush of each new purchase. It's never enough to simply have enough. How much is enough? Without asking this question, we blindly pursue excess. We've been acculturated to drink from the fire hose of consumption, acquire, consume, indulge more, more, more. How much is enough? Without an answer, we don't know how to proceed because we don't know when to stop. Mindless desire takes us by the hand. Naturally, enough is different for each of us. Mm -hmm. Enough changes as our needs and circumstances change. Your enough may include a sofa, coffee table, and TV. A dining table that seats six, a three-bedroom home, a two-car garage, a backyard trampoline. Or that might be too much. Enough changes over time. Yesterday's enough may be too much today. How much is enough? Less than enough is depriving. More than enough is indulging. Enough is the sweet spot in the middle, the place where intentionality intersects with contentment, where lust doesn't get in the way of creating something meaningful. Mm. Sure, you could pursue more, but could is not a good reason to do anything. Enough is enough when you decide it's enough. Yeah. So I uh, love people use things. If you want to check out the book comes out really soon in about two months. So I uh, love people use things.net or pre-order it wherever you would get your books, like your local indie bookshop. <laughs> Emily has a question for us in South Carolina. I have a small business and work out of my home and paper is my enemy. I unsubscribe from everything, try to get off contact lists and have turned everything I can into e-statements. However, I still have the past seven years of tax returns, documents, receipts, and other types of papers that I don't know what to do with. 
I tried to go paperless last year for my business, but the app I was using would mysteriously delete images and spending and mileage that I had spent time inputting, so I canceled it because it made me nervous. My question is, how can I go paperless for both my life and business? I get so worried that my computer will crash or I'll have a fire or flood, but I also am not great with technology and don't fully understand backing things up or using the cloud and things like that. So, Ryan, when I hear Emily here, Mm. I I certainly identify with this, although I see some problems with her problem. I do. Um, What do you see? Well, the first thing I see is she said she's not adept with using some of these things. Uh And... You know, having enough, uh, living a, a minimalist lifestyle, it's there's it's not easy. Yeah, it's 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 difficult, and there are some things that you're gonna, uh, in her case, there are some things you're gonna have to maybe go out of your way and learn how to do. Right. So, um, th- so that's that's my way of saying to uh, Emily here is don't be scared uh-huh. of the technology. Right. Embrace it. Yeah. Um. You and I didn't know how to do it until we knew how to do it. Exactly. Like, go out of your way to, A, give yourself permission to kind of uh, mess up a little bit and have a little bit of a learning curve. I mean, not to the extent of, like, obviously we don't want her records getting deleted, but uh, but just don't be nervous going into technology. I don't know how else to say it. That's, that's the first problem that I see is that she sounds a little trepidatious to get into the different apps. And, and it's things understandable like that. because it's yes, overwhelming. Right? 100%. And yeah. so I want to, I want to break down the problem, make it a little bit less overwhelming. And, and in fact, once we identify what enough is, you won't be overwhelmed at all. Right now you're overwhelmed because yeah. you have more than enough information. Mm-hmm. Now, Ryan and I are going to share some practical tips with you. We have some articles. We'll put a link to both of them in the show notes. We'll, we'll get to those in a moment because there are some practical things you can do. However, it's quixotic to think that I can just do, I can add some apps and some technology and by adding more, that's how I'll get down to enough. Yeah. And that's why I thought this was such a good question for this episode because we're not doing a full paper clutter episode, but it's worth at least discussing. Now, yeah. let's be clear, Ryan, you and I aren't paperless. We don't have a paper. In fact, I'm, here's, here's the ultimate irony. Here's this New York Times article we're going to read from in a moment, or at least we'll put a link to it in the show notes. It's called Gear for a Paperless off at home office gear for a paperless home office i've printed this you out printed on paper out. that's great now I, I do that for the podcast for a reason let me i don't just want to print things willy-nilly but ryan and i have found that having screens between us actually degrades the conversation yeah and we're trying to avoid that and so if i have to print out some paper which by the way is a renewable resource mm-hmm. I, i've talked to environmentalists you know we've interviewed quite a few and they're like well uh, you know honestly if, if you're if you're getting if you're printing from using your know, regrowth forests, yeah. if you actually care about trees, you use paper, right. which seems counterintuitive to me. I'm not completely on board with that yet. Right. I don't just like randomly use a bunch of paper, but for this podcast, it makes more sense than yeah. having screens that create a barrier for us. Yeah. In fact, uh, I th- often think that our screens are, are creating all these new barriers. We, there's a lot of talk about building a wall. We've built walls mm. it, and, and they're digital walls in between all of us. When you go out, you see it in memes all the time now where it's like people are all you know, family around the dinner table and they're all just like staring into this this really enticing glowing box. <laughs> I read a meme that said something like uh, I'll be watching uh, Netflix on the internet um, uh, and then I get bored so I have to see what's going on on the little internet. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's that's such a good point. It's yeah. like it, it, we don't watch TV anymore. We watch the internet on the big internet or the small internet. Right. The, now we have medium internet. Right, exactly. it's, the Ronnie Chang joke, which is also in Love People Use Things in the technology chapter, he says, it seems like, er, you know, he's an immigrant. And he, and he said, that it seems like every night in America is a contest to see how many screens I can get between my face and the wall. Yeah. And he goes through the whole bit and it's like the TV and then I've got my computer my laptop and my iPad and my iPhone and then boom, Apple Watch. Right. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. We have all these screens in between us. So what I'm really saying here is if you have a problem that is not solvable uh, by technology, I'm sorry, that you think is solvable by technology, it may be solvable when you better understand the problem. It may be solvable without technology as well. So let's help Emily understand. Let's do that. So first off, uh, becoming completely paperless is sort is fine Mm -hmm. but if we're renouncing paper i'm never ever going to use paper again what does that do 
when you renounce something, it forever attaches you to it. Right. And so by renouncing paper, what Emily has done inadvertently, and that's this is why it's so overwhelming to her at first, mm. is she's now attached herself to not just paper, but the idea that I must be paperless. Yeah. And therefore, any bit of paper is an indiscretion. Yeah. And I have failed if I bring one post-it note into my home office. Yes. So, Emily, just consider yourself paperless-ish. <laughs> yeah. yeah paper full. <laughs> paper full. <laughs> I mean, you are paper full right now. But here's right. the thing. What's the big problem if, if you've if you've gone out of your way to be relatively paperless mm -hmm. or reduce the amount of paper that you have, maybe it's a better way to put it, yeah. a paper reduction. Yeah. If you have seven years of tax records because your accountant says you need seven years of tax records, okay, what's the problem with that? If you have the essential tax records, mm -hmm. I don't see a problem with that. I have one file cabinet at home Me too. that has some tax information, has some receipts in there, and then I'll go through there every 90 days and I call the superfluous information out of there yeah. and anything I don't need gets shredded and then boom, I'm, I'm done. Uh, I don't have to spend a ton of time on it mm -hmm. and I don't have to worry about it because I know quarterly, I just go through there, mm -hmm. extract the things. And then also we have a, a, an accountant who actually handles our business paperwork. Yeah. And so maybe that's an option. I don't know if you have an accountant, but they may be able to store the things for you. So yeah. our accountant actually stores our tax information for us, mm -hmm. which is really helpful. And they store it in the cloud. It's all backed up and it's secure. And you have to have someone and a system that you trust, but it's okay to outsource some of that trust as well. Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind for me is like, like a QuickBooks type thing where it handles everything. It, like you can put taxes in there you can put receipts in there mm -hmm. um and again emily this is going to take especially if you have seven years worth of paper mm -hmm. it's going to take some time to go paperless right or uh to go paperless ish <laughs> to yeah. reduce your amount of paper but uh yeah like so with our accountant um yes like they handle everything but you don't have to have an accountant to handle everything, you can have an, an, an application that handles. No, so, we didn't have an accountant until a couple of years ago. Exactly. And my feeling too, she was talking about things randomly getting deleted. Uh -huh. I mean, there's, I don't know what she was using, but there's probably an, an easier solution than just giving up. Well, let's go into some of the solutions here. So before yep. we have a couple articles here. In fact, I'm just going to put a link to this one in the show notes. Gear for a paperless home office. This has some different scanners and different software, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to spend time reading through the, the entire article, but I, I will say that there are different scanners and things out there that once you un have understood the complexity of the problem, I'll say one other thing, though, before Ryan gets into his PC mag article that he has here, and we'll put a link to that one in the show notes as well. But let me just say this, that if paper is your enemy, then you might be fighting the wrong battle. Right. Right. So I wouldn't treat paper as the enemy. And I, I know you're saying that tongue in cheek, Emily, but when, whenever I think of an enemy, then all of a sudden I feel as though I, now I have something that is insurmountable. An enemy it means yeah. I have to fight them. I have to battle them. Well, paper is just something I need to scan. I don't need to battle it, right? <laughs> and Or shred it. The truth is, most of the things that I'm holding on to mm -hmm. can probably be shredded without even scanning it. In the first. That's what I realized when I first embraced minimalism. And I was going through those scanning parties. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, I was holding on to so much stuff just in case. Yeah. But then I just shredded it because I never, I knew I was never going to actually need it. Now, you've got an article here from PC Mag. That, yeah. What's it called? It is called Five Apps You Need to Go Paperless. Now, what I like about this, Ryan, is it's not specific apps, but it's like a category of apps, right? Yes. So yes. what's the first one? So the first one is a to-do list app. So there are so many different versions of this. Um, I use, honestly, I use my, my notepad. To yeah, do, I use Apple Notes. Yeah, to do, to do a to-do list. But there are apps out there that will help you color code and organize them a little different. I mean, you've got to decide what you're most comfortable with. Evernote is one that I, yeah. I, a lot of people are familiar with. Mm -hmm. Sean, you use something that's Google re related, right? I've used uh, the it's Google, called uh, Google Keep. Google Keep. Yeah, that's yeah. it. And any dot do, but he, there's there's some other there there are some other uh, apps in this article as well. What's the the second category? Ryan? Second category is a scanning app. I also use Apple Notes for that now. Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Yeah, so so Apple Notes a few updates ago they added the scanning capability, so you can scan things with your iPhone. And there's a Google equivalent if you have an Android smartphone. Mm. If you just have a flip phone, like. Uh, 
the gal that I met over at the oh oh someone just walked into our studio here. <laughs> uh, the, I just met a gal over at the grocery store the other day. She's like, hey, minimalist. Like I I um. Delilah was her name. Yeah. Uh, she works at the grocery store. She's like, I've been using a flip phone for three months now. Oh, wow. And she was showing them, like, that's amazing. So yeah. y y then you don't have the scanning capability. So you and I also have, like, a photo scanner, document scanner that we've yes. used in the past before it was you were able to do it with your phone. Yeah. That's another option as well. Yeah, super simple to use. Honestly, like, I, use, I didn't know I could do that in notes. I'll start using that now. But I just I use my camera. Like if I need something, I take a picture of it, and then you can easily convert it to like a PDF or something. Yeah, that's what Notes does for you using your camera. So yeah, it's great. What's the awesome. next category? An e-signature tool. This is pretty valuable. Um, I use DocuSign. Yeah, I was gonna say like I think I'm just thinking about all the things that we've had to sign over the years, and it seems like DocuSign is like pretty much the easiest technology to use. Yeah, then there are fewer and fewer places that are requiring what's called a wet signature. It's mm -hmm. still a thing, which is it's so odd. It is, yeah. Uh, but uh, if you don't require a wet signature, then having the, the docu sign or the equivalent, there's no sponsorship here. You do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's just who we use. For sure. And then there's a file syncing service. That's category number four. Okay, so file syncing, like Dropbox is what we use, for yes. example. Yep. Uh, Google has uh, their their version of this as well. Mm -hmm. Box is another company that does the... the so basically, l let me explain. If my computer were to crash mm -hmm. or my home were to burn down, and my entire apartment building burned down, mm -hmm. everything that's on my hard drive would be destroyed, right. but it's also backed up onto Dropbox and it automatically syncs. Dropbox is relatively simple for me and, and we pay an annual fee in order to make that you know, work because you're you're it's, you're paying for storage space basically. 100%, I know Emily said she wasn't comfortable with the cloud, but again, this is one of those things, Emily, if, if you're not willing to embrace the technology, then you are going to be stuck with a bunch of paper. Right. And so, and, and that's okay. It's a cost of admission, of right? Of course. And so the, the, there are a couple options here, Ryan. You can have, in fact, I have redundancy. And so it's much safer than if I were just have a bunch of paperwork in my attic, which I don't have an attic, but if it was in my closet and the place burned down, paperwork's gone. And yeah. I, there's nothing I can do about it. There's no way I can, ba it's not backed up anywhere. Now, if I have it on my hard drive and then it, the paperwork's shredded, and then my hard drive is destroyed, then all the same thing as yeah. if my house caught on fire. Yeah. Now, if it's on the hard drive and it's in the cloud, now I have some redundancy. Yeah. So even if something were to happen to my computer or if something were to happen to the cloud, mm -hmm. I have backup options here. 100%. And what's 100%. the fifth category, Ryan? The fifth category is a document sharing tool. Okay, so, so a document sharing tool like what? What are the examples they provide oh, there? Um, a common way to send digital documents is attach them to an email. That option isn't always ideal. Oh, yeah. However, because you can't always tell when or if the recipient got them. Like you, Google Drive yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, you can use red receipts, but they only work if the recipient hasn't blocked or declined them. Okay. All right, well, we'll put yeah. a link to that in the show notes. Yeah. Enjoy those five different... Uh, they say five apps, right? But really, it's just five categories to help you go paperless. Or maybe a better way to say it is paper light. If we go paper light, <laughs> in which like Ryan that. and I are, even though during our podcast, it's by far the most paper heavy part of our week. In fact, I uh, I can't think of any time I print anything else except during our podcast so I can avoid having any screen in this room whatsoever. Yeah. And it is calming, strangely, right? But it is. By yeah. removing those screens, I feel like it's it's just me and you in this room. And mm -hmm. Sean and Jordan, who are naked, it's really strange. I don't know why they do this. <laughs> Naked. Because they're right. minimalists. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It is time for the lightning round where we answer your text messages. You can text your questions and comments to 937-202-4654. Yes, indeed. Now, during the lightning round, this is where Ryan do our best to answer questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text of those minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. You can find all of our minimal maxims in one place now. It's called minimalmaxims.com. We got a question, right. Ryan? Yeah, from Carol. How do we learn to recognize the difference between enough and a false sense of security and comfort from unnecessary consumerism? Well, here's my pithy answer, which I already read to you from Love People Use Things. That's how I ended that passage. Mm. Enough is enough when you decide it's enough. Yeah. Now, let's unpack that. So getting back to her question here, how do we learn to recognize? Well, 
learning and recognizing are two different things. So maybe we'll just say, how do we recognize? Recognize is a type of understanding. I would even call it a low grade understanding. So how do we understand enough is really what her question is. Mm -hmm. Like how, and, and that becomes not an intellectual exercise. Mm -hmm. That becomes a visceral exercise. When you talk about the pallets of toilet paper, it's not that there is a number that you can understand. I have understood that 17 rolls of toilet paper is the right amount for me to purchase. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It's a feeling. And, and, and that's really where the truth lies. I'm not talking about a fact here. I'm talking about the truth. The mm -hmm. truth is that I'm going to buy enough for me. Yeah. And that might not be enough for you. But, of course, enough is enough when you've decided, or maybe even better put, enough is enough when you understand it's enough. Yeah. Yeah, I... Uh my pithy answer is this, don't confuse enough with perfection or don't confuse enough for perfection. And, and the thing is, is there's not a number uh -huh. for enough. Right. There's not, um, enough is not an exact. It is a, I, I look at it as a, uh, you know, there's, there's a range of what enough is. And mm. to me, it's, it's a, the essence of, yeah. of, of being, a, of having the appropriate amount of things. Yes. So, if you confuse enough with perfection, then you're never going to feel like you have enough or you're, you're always going to feel like either you have too little or too much. Right. Um, it's like saying, did I drink enough water today? Now, of course, they, you know, certain people recommend 64 ounces of water, eight, eight glasses of water a day. Right. But, of course, well, that's confusing as well because there are different qualities of water. A moment ago, we talked, it's some water, you go to Flint, you drink 64 ounces of lead water. Yeah. That's actually bad for you. Mm. That's more than enough because yeah. it's detrimental to you. Anything that is detrimental to you is more than enough. Yeah. And so w it, it has to do with the quality of enough as well. The quality of that water. Does it have the appropriate minerals? And, and, and even then, it's not the 64. Even if you have the perfectly filtered water from Mountain Valley, Arkansas, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it has the minerals, but is 64 ounces the perfect number? And therefore, everything else is imperfect? Yeah. Everything else is more than enough or not enough? No, it's not that. It depends on all kinds of other factors. Did I work out today? Am I sweating more? What environment am I in? What's my, what's my altitude? Yeah. Enough is a feeling just as much more so than it is a quantity. Yeah, it's it's perspectival and it, you know, it's up to each individual to kind of really accept what's appropriate. I would I would stop looking at enough and start looking at appropriate. Mm. If if I was having an issue with you know, understanding like, oh, do I have enough? Mm -hmm. The question I would start asking myself is what's the appropriate amount of whatever it is that I'm looking for? Ooh. And, and you can back into enough because yeah. ooh, here's another pithy one for you, Sean. Enough is always appropriate. Mm. Yes. Boom. All right, Ryan, we got a bunch more to talk about, but first, what do you got for us? Here are some voicemail comments and insights from our listeners. Check them out. Hey, Josh and Ryan, this is Jansen from Memphis. Um, you may already know about this, but you can make bananas taste like ice cream if you freeze them and then blend them in a food processor. Um, you can add peanut butter or honey or other fruit to it or whatever. Hi, Jess and Ryan. This is Teresa from Minneapolis, Minnesota, calling in regards to the digital clutter episode. Um, I've actually been carrying down a lot of social media recently, going through each, removing old posts and accounts, and this has been tedious, but it's also been a good reminder of all the time I've wasted. Uh, currently, I'm going through Facebook, and I wasn't planning to because I'm a nostalgic person, but it's been eye-opening seeing all these old posts of times that there was a lot of not so great memories or times that I had posted having a great time, but I was actually going through a hard time in my life. Uh, it's actually made it easier for me to let go of these posts now, now that I've seen that it wasn't as great as I remembered. So that's helped me move forward with that. Um, one other tip for using social media on your computer is to bookmark a different page of that site instead of the main page. So for YouTube, I have it linked to my subscription page. Facebook is linked to a custom friends list I made of just close friends and family. That way I'm only looking at a short condensed page when I'm logging in. And most days I'm only spending about one or two minutes on Facebook and YouTube just seeing what's in there and then closing it and being done for the day. So hopefully someone will find these helpful. And thanks and have a great day. 
All right, y'all. We have a bunch more surprise questions this Thursday on Patreon. That's the maximal episode on the Minimalist Private Podcast, theminimalists.com slash support if you want to subscribe. But first, real quick, for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists. We want to help you find enough. We help you declutter your smartphone and computer as well. Uh, the minimalists have seven different wallpapers. You can download all seven for free for your smartphone or computer. That's the love people use things wallpaper, which you get for free. Scrolling is the new smoking. What love a, that one. What a timely reminder right now. Less is now, which we actually had before our film came out. You know, it was it was really a mantra for us. Like mm-hmm. yeah, obviously we, the, the the less is more. The 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 old saying by. Uh, Van Mies, mm-hmm. um, or Van Der Rohe, rather, Mies Van Der Rohe, uh, mm-hmm. he, 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 came, he coined less is more, and we said, well, yeah, but less is now. Right. Like, <laughs> and, and so so now is the important part of that. And then, of course, what I really want to get across to you, five questions to ask before buying. This is great. And, and so I love that list. When we're struggling with enough, what is it, Ryan? It's like I, I go into a store and it's mm-hmm. like, well, I, I, I want this. I want that. I want that. It's fear-based. We just talked about that. Yeah. But this is a little reminder. It's right there on the home screen of your phone. Download it for free. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't think about this earlier in the episode, but like that is a great tool to help you help you uh, understand what enough is. Right. Yeah. Right. Because questioning always yeah. helps us identify what is too much, what is too little, and what is enough. You can download those for free right now over on our resources page, theminimalists.com slash resources. For our added value this week, Ryan, I want to play you a new song. It's called Perfume. It's a on this EP called Sky on Fire. The guy's name is Mero, not like Jesus and Mero. Mm. It's this young kid, and the video for this is a great video, but these lyrics really stood out to me because we're always sort of yearning for more mm-hmm. than enough. Mm-hmm. And the, the sort of opening lines to the song here is, the present is so unsatisfying. I wish I was materialistic, excited for the future unfolding. Thank God I'm not realistic. And he goes on to, to this line says, I'd be a fool not to love you. Mm-hmm. Now, there's this song, and it's a gorgeous song, which you're going to hear in a moment. But think about that. Thank God I'm not realistic. I wish I was more materialistic. Mm. So I'm not materialistic, and therefore I'm not realistic. Therefore, realistic in our society is to be materialistic. Uh, And so when we are being realistic, you you hear those people say this all the time, oh, I can be a minimalist. That's just not realistic. Yeah. Yeah, that's the point. It's a whole, yeah. The point is we're trying to not be realistic anymore. How is realistic working out for you? Mm. Enjoy the song. It's really beautiful. Marrow's song. It's called Perfume. We have a bunch more surprise questions this week, like how do we find the strength to oppose the status quo? How do we teach our children to be happy with what they have and not compare their belongings with the belongings of others? How do you handle when your enough is different from your partner's enough? I'm sure Ryan has some insight on that. Plus, the science behind why our brains miss opportunities to improve through subtraction. And a million more questions for The Minimalist. If you want to hear all that, Join us on The Minimalist Private Podcast this week. Visit theminimalists.com slash support to subscribe and get your personal link so that our private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app. By the way, now is the time to subscribe. You can join thousands of other folks because we're building a brand new studio. You see we're in this temporary studio space right now if you're watching the video version. But now is the time because you're going to help us build the studio and it is going to be beautiful. We have some wonderful plans. Plus, you get all of our archives. Talk about enough. Mm. There's enough to listen to for a very long time. We have a palette of (laughs) private podcast episodes out there. And you can, you can actually just dive in, though. You don't have to take home the whole palette. Mm-hmm. You just go in there and grab one roll at a time, digitally, whenever you'd like, and you wipe your butt with our minimalism. <laughs> you can follow The Minimalist on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at The Minimalists. Come to one of our live podcast shows. Visit theminimalists.com tour to find a city near you. If you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip, 
email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode, youtube.com slash theminimalists. If you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. You'll also receive our simple Sunday emails, any minimalist writings that we write. You'll get those for free right there in your inbox. And if you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it.